is the five. As you just saw, President Trump wrapping up a speech to steel workers in Illinois just moments ago. He's also visited farmers in Iowa. That was earlier today. We had this hat made up. Look at that. It's, awesome. it's the John Deere colors, actually. But <laughs> make our farmers great again, isn't that great? Make our <laughs> Basically, we opened up Europe. And that's going to be a great thing for Europe. And it's been really going to be a great thing for us. And it's going to be a really great thing for our farmers. After years of shutdowns and cutbacks, today the blast furnace here in Granite City is blazing bright. Workers are back on the job, and we are once again pouring new American steel into the spine of our country. Now, some people are saying one of the biggest problems for Democrats in 2018 this year and 2020, the presidential election year, is the party's inability to develop a cohesive message to counter President Trump. In fact, an op-ed in the New York Times today foreshadows Trump winning re-election in 2020 due to the strong economy. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is rumored to be a future possible opponent of the president's, offered a much different approach than Trump. Here she is calling for higher taxes? There was a time in a very prosperous America, uh, an America that was growing a middle class, an America in which working families were doing better generation after generation after generation, where the top marginal rate was well above 50 percent. So, Jesse, I think the president and Republicans want to talk about the economy, about the stock market doing well. They, they've had some trouble delivering the message on the benefits of the tax cut. But we see the president getting out there, and this may be the message he wants to deliver going into the midterms. First of all, I want that green hat. That looks pretty good. And, uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It would cover up our, our, our wonderful yeah, haircut. Yeah, you did just get your haircut, Jesse. That's true. You know what? I don't What a waste that. of money if you do um, that. I think, I agree. I think Trump needs to focus like a laser on the economy and law and order and judges and keep hammering Democrats as socialist freaks who kneel during the national anthem. There are great headlines coming out of the economy. We're supposed to get an enormous GDP number tomorrow maybe three, four, five percent. We've had three straight quarters of three percent GDP economic growth and the low unemployment's fantastic for everyone and the tax cut has delivered a twenty six hundred dollar cut to every family in this country. But there are areas of concern. The wages dipped a little bit the last quarter. They're still up two point eight percent where under Obama they were flat. And the trade deal is tough because you know you see some places like we we're talking about, you know, you have steel companies closing and then you have aluminum companies opening up. And what he did with the EU was actually very smart. I think what he did is he's saying for short term pain we want long term gain. So he raised some tariffs and they came back begging yesterday and they have a verbal deal and they're gonna now drop the tariffs on non industrial goods, they're gonna drop the tariffs on liquefied natural gas. We still have the auto tariffs in play, which isn't good for Michigan and South Carolina. But all in all, you know, the, the, the farm subsidies, I think, are good politics, but bad economics. But it's just showing the trade partners, listen, we're going to soften the blow because you're not going to inflict any pain on us. And in order to eventually bring down all trade barriers, and that's the goal, free and open and fair trade. Okay, so Dana, Jesse makes the case, I think, from the Trump perspective, that you want your partners, I think the president said his favorite word is reciprocal. 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 Yeah. But here's the thing. In the papers today, it said, My Little Pony, Jack Daniels, Coca-Cola, GM, the farmers, and Whirlpool all say, you know what, this is hurting us, hurting our profits. It is, and, uh, well, and I think that's one of the reasons you saw the president, one, be conciliatory towards the EU yesterday. It's just good for our allies for us to be, work together. They didn't actually agree to anything yesterday. They just agreed to stop fighting in public and to deal with the issues. And I, it, that's great because we need to fight as allies against uh, countries like China. I think that the president is smart to get out of town. If, it, in the early years of the Bush administration, that first term, the economy was great. You could not get a lot of media coverage around it. Obviously, we were at war as well. The, the great thing for the president, if he wants good headlines, is he has to go to these places and watch where the president goes. He's going to places where he can help vulnerable Republican members. He went to Iowa today in Illinois. There's two members there, Republicans, that are in very bad shape, and he wanted to go and help shore them up. He'll probably return to those places. Uh, the other thing I would say is getting that Wisconsin, Minnesota, and uh, Michigan all of his numbers there are really bad. 
Um, and so the, the, where these tariff issues should help, should be there. They're not helping so much, so he's got to figure out how to, figure, how, to, how to turn that around. And by being conciliatory towards the EU, he might be able to do that. Greg, how did you get back from Granite City so quickly? Well, you know, I have a private plane. <laughs> oh, I see. And a tunnel. Must be nice. And a tunnel. <laughs> a tunnel. Uh, you know, it's, it's like looking at uh, Liz Warren and, and other folks like Cory Booker. Right now, uh, we have so much good news, so much good news. Yep. And the Dems are fixated on finding bad news. They're like those old, strange men on the beach with metal, metal detectors, you know, that always are walking I'm too close to, to you. Something. Yeah, hoping to find something, except they're misery detectors, and they can't find any misery, so they have to invent misery. In this case, Liz Warren wants to raise tax rates to 50% for people, for some people, and roll back the tax cuts. She's essentially a success extinguisher. <laughs> She's looking at the economy like it's a fire, and she wants to put it out. That's what she's doing. So uh, here's what I worry about, is that they might achieve something. What I've noticed is that we're, we might be entering the second part of a political cycle that's been going on for the, since the 60s. The Republicans come in and they fix things. <laughs> and then that allows the Democrats to come in and break things because there are things to be broken. And then you get the Republicans back in to fix things because the Democrats broke things and the Republicans fix things. And then the, the public says, oh, now we can sustain more Democrats. So they come in to break things. And this goes back and forth. So Republicans <laughs> fix, Democrats break. Republicans fix, Democrats break. This has been going on since the 1960s. So now Trump has fixed a half a dozen things. And everybody's going, hey, you know what, let's give those Democrats another chance. Let them right. break some stuff. Well, we, we can't let them break it. But, <laughs> but to, to, to Dana's point, too, you know, he is there because of vulnerable members of Congress. But he's also talking to, I think, key constituencies right now, talking to steel workers and farmers, because there are people that have felt the effect of this, you know, trade tariffs that are going back and forth. And so I think his message to them, both with the farmers and the steel workers, is I'm with you. I was with you because you were the forgotten men and women who President Obama left behind. And I'm standing with you now and I'm fighting for you. And so I think it's a really critical time for him to be sending that message and also to be touting the fact that we have seen hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs added under President Trump. The economy is good. One quick As Jesse question. pointed out, GDP growth tomorrow. Uh, one quick question. Okay. The deficit, because he's offering yeah. 12 billion billion in subsidies to the farmers and even the farmers are like boy you know with the tax cut that didn't pan out and now this that blows up the deficit. there used to be a republican thing no I'm not, it used to be a, I, I'm not wasn't down. a democrat thing no, i said republican what? i know but i mean democrats didn't care about deficits uh, oh. you guys invented them uh, yeah. no, no one does. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not down i'm not down with the bailout but i think president trump can say that i'm fighting with for you and yesterday's press conference also came at a critical time for him to be able to say that look this is having okay. some movement in effect all right trump allies pushing to impeach rod rosenstein but could the plan open the door for Democrats to go after President Trump? Boy, that's a big debate, and it's next. Republicans are planning to impeach Rod Rosenstein. We'll see how that goes. Freedom Caucus leaders are accusing the Deputy Attorney General of stonewalling their request for documents, but aren't finding the support they need right now. Meantime, a turn in what the President calls the Russia witch hunt. Special Counsel Robert Mueller is reportedly examining the President's tweets in a possible obstruction case. All right, so I think what, let's start with the Rosenstein situation, Dana. I think what they're asking for are the original documents that existed to justify the opening of this Russia-Trump probe. And they have not been able to find any of those documents. They've been mm -hmm. stonewalled and the subpoenas have not been respected. But it doesn't look like this thing's going to go anywhere, the impeachment deal. Yeah, I don't think so. This is one of those ones where I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it, it's not going anywhere. And um, you have even had Alan Dershowitz say, it is the most short-sighted and I have to say stupid thing I have heard in a long time that you have Basically what he's saying is that we have Democrats out there saying impeach, impeach, impeach of the president, and that obviously looks ridiculous. Oh, yeah. And that this is like Republicans, like 20 of them, saying, okay, impeach Rod Rosenstein over something that the Justice Department says is not necessary. Anyway, so no, I don't think that's going anywhere. It could have been contempt. That might have been a, a more of a stepping stone before impeachment. Greg, yeah, what do you think? think? Yeah, I, I don't think I've heard a single person that has actually said this is a good idea. 
Um, I, and I think it's a great idea. <laughs> hey, hey, America, okay. that's a great idea. America, there is your proof. Juan, Juan is saying that this is a good idea. idea. Do not great do it. Idea. By the way, I do, the, here's the big problem. Impeachment proceedings require hearings, which we will be required to carry. All right? And these are going to be really boring, stupid hearings. And it'll and cut into the five. It'll cut into, you won't, you won't, cut into the monologue. You will cut yeah. into the monologue. There'll be no five. You'll miss outnumbered. You Fox and Friends. <laughs> Everything's gone, and then all your favorite the shows on other will channels yeah. will be gone. Do you know Judge Judy? Is Judge uh, Judy still around? Uh, yeah, yeah, she's, she's yeah. making a lot of money, Greg. Yeah. All right, Juan, what do you think about this? And what do you think about Mueller going after Trump's mean tweets? <laughs> I don't think it's the meanness. I think it's evidence or potential evidence of obstruction and what he's trying to do. But to me, this is a wonderful political story. I mean, forget for a second the impeachment. Impeachment is just, I mean, that's so, it's so petty and mean spirit. I don't know. But anyway, but did you I'll feel that way about going after that. Trump? Yeah, I'll remember what you, you said that after I'll the impeachment. Somebody impe is somebody Maxine trying to Waters wants to impeach Trump. No, but the, that's excuse different. Me, excuse me. These guys are the majority. They're in power, Greg. They can actually do this. But of course, what you heard from even uh, Speaker Paul Ryan is, uh, not ha he doesn't support but he it, right? Did, but he also said that he's frustrated as well with the DOJ and not providing the documents that have been subpoenaed and asked for. And we look at things like text messages that popped up in the IG report that were never given to Congress. So I think it's perfectly fair for Republicans that are conducting these investigations to be frustrated with Rod Rosenstein. And so I think the point of this is to stir some sort of action to put pressure on leadership, put pressure on the DOJ and Rod Rosenstein. Look, you've got to have the numbers for impeachment and they don't have that in the House. You're not going to have it uh, moving forward if anything happened in the House to the Senate. So, I mean, the numbers aren't there. So I think the point is to put pressure and Congress really doesn't have a lot of tools at their disposal. You look at contempt. What did that do with Eric Holder? Absolutely. But, nothing. but, but Lisa, this is not high crimes and misdemeanors. No law has been broken. Well, that's what they're trying to find out. What they're looking for, Juan, are the documents that show how did the investigation well, begin? Fine. But there's no was there probable cause? Was there intelligence? Fine. We got the why are they throwing spies? You and, just got the Spicer also, report on, this thing. weekend. And they're looking at when they they issued the FISA warrant. Yeah, you just got proper that. FBI. You saw it this protocol weekend. followed. No, they didn't. They're also looking oh for re what was redacted from the five as a warrant. This and the fact so that Rosenstein maybe. hasn't come forward and say, here you go, because you guys have proper oversight, makes people think, why isn't this guy playing ball? This well, is such a mistake. We just let it die. Let it go away. No, Greg. No, Greg. You know what? One wants it to live. By the way, my camera's out. See, I can't. Also, the, <laughs> I don't know where to look. The house is now out for five weeks. Wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, today's is their last day week for vacation. five weeks. Yeah. Want the, I'm Jesse, running for Congress. <laughs> Jesse, you want them out there comp campaigning, so don't complain. Also, okay. this is a really so, tough job. Jesse, <laughs> wait, they'll Jesse's four days in anyway. now. All right, What's yeah, your send platform? me money. The super PAC is over here. All right, Go could Mark me. Zuckerberg <laughs> be out at Facebook? Oh, we'll find out. <laughs> Some big problems brewing for big tech. President Trump taking aim at Twitter over its reported shadow banning of some prominent conservatives. The social media platform under fire for allegedly restricting Republicans' visibility in search results. The president vows to look into what he calls the illegal practice, though Twitter officials describe it as a glitch they're trying to fix. And Mark Zuckerberg is on the hot seat after his company loses over 100 billion with the b dollars in value in the wake of its mounting scandals facebook shareholders have reportedly filed a proposal to remove him as chairman is that too extreme greg i don't know i mean this is very interesting uh to coin a phrase i think with social media the bloom has come off the rose oh that's a great yeah, saying i think that'll really catch on yeah 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 <laughs> i want to can I, i'm going to quote this is the greatest thing ever said about okay. social media walter kern tweeted this last night he said, if Twitter sells you conflict, Instagram sells you envy, mm. and Facebook simply sells you. Oh, okay, and I, that's and perfect. I think, and I that think that uh, if you think about that, people are starting to figure, figure it out. When you get on Twitter, you get angry. When you get on Instagram, you get jealous. And when you're on Facebook, you feel like you're being manipulated. And I think there's time to, like, these things have grown very quickly. Pull back, take a day off, Twitter. Figure out, should you, should you ban anonymity? Could that change Twitter? It could, if everybody's name was attached, that would be pretty, that would be a start. Then you would know, I mean, the shadow banning thing, Lisa, what do you think about it? I mean, the, the liberals sort of caught on last week to this 
uh, issue, and they said that conservatives were being favored by Facebook, and they got headlines out of that. Well, I thought what was the most illuminating is Jonathan Swan of Axios, who I think does a great job doing reporting, but he said that basically conservatives have been coming to him for a while now and saying that stuff like this was going on, and he never believed it. And what's interesting is now that it was reported in Vice, which is a liberal publication, mm -hmm. people might actually take it seriously. So I, I thought that was sort of illuminating. Um, but regarding Facebook, they made basically the biggest mistake of all, which was getting caught in President Trump's orbit and all of this Russia stuff, because Facebook basically was like Teflon. Uh, until that hit, and now they're dealing with the carnage and the damage of it. Well, I know what Facebook did wrong. They messed with diamond and silk. And that <laughs> is the problem. That's yes. why you see their market value plunge. It's the curse of diamond and silk. In all seriousness, though, I would buy Facebook. <laughs> I mean, this it's down. That's 20%. why I wonder. I mean, I know nothing about how to um, <laughs> do those things, but what, I was buy uh, and sell stock. Yeah, I don't really. You know. call I don't, your broker. I don't really have one. Like I don't. Facebook. But well, I mean, I have some. I don't know. It's like a mutual fund, but whatever. Is, is this now a good time to buy? I Facebook? would buy it. I mean, it's way down, and it's a big. It's a great company, and Zuckerberg's a genius, and he aced the Capitol Hill hearing. I think he's a really smart guy. It's down a little bit right now. You're looking for a job, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if he ever writes a book. He want, Juan, you tell true. me, um, is it too extreme to say that Zuckerberg should be out of a job? No, it's crazy. I mean, he created this. It's, I mean, and also, remember, I think Jesse said this to me just a moment ago. He said, you know, the only way that you can justify losing that much money is you made even more money. And he's made a lot of money for a lot of people. And uh, I don't think Facebook's going away, but I think it's going to change. Uh, I think one of the things that I'd like to see it change is ban in this pretense that they are a neutral platform. They're not neutral. Uh, they have to make decisions, and they should, in fact, censor some of the hate speech. I mean, people you know, here, from Sandy Hook who children trying to use, were attacked. Well, they're trying but, to use a mix of people, but also algorithms to do that, and but, it's frustrating. Yeah, but the yeah. algorithms are what got them in trouble yesterday, but because yes. people said, wow. oh, some of these Republican drop, things that automatically drop when yeah. you click isn't quite working. And then they said it was the algorithms. But, but the problem is the people that create the algorithms are usually politically correct whiz kids. And there's bias baked into that cake. If you're designing an algorithm that says conservative speech is more akin to hate speech mm. than liberal speech, no. you're automatically going to be biased against conservatives. Maybe it's that what you see, is you have to watch this carefully because I, I side with you. I want free speech, but right. I'm going to tell you, hate speech, bullying, harassment, but intimidation, the fake that stuff. should not be but oh, fake stuff. But I think Ben Sass did the best fake job. Fake stuff, they'll have to get rid well, of the New York Times. <laughs> oh my God. But Ben Sass asked Mark Zuckerberg to try to define hate speech, and he stumbled and struggled yeah. with defining it. So I think that's yeah, the problem. But my, yeah, favorite, but my favorite tweet, there's a Reason reporter that tweeted after the Senate hearing and said that Mark Zuckerberg has every millennial's worst fear of trying to explain technology to the nation's elderly. Because that was part of why you did so well at the hearing. Well, a lot of people are complaining are not elderly. Okay, well, well with the, all due respect. <laughs> hate speech, sorry to say, is in the eye of the beholder. Right. And it depends who's in charge, and they're going to say that you're, me you're being mean to me. So that's what the, pro the problem with hate speech is that it's subjective. It's like art. It is, it is. Uh, and the other thing, too, is I don't think people understand algorithms you know, you, you, just because somebody is using an algorithm on you isn't wrong. They're test like everybody does A/B testing with companies. They try, let's say, in, in let's say McDonald's, they'll try McRiblets in one place, Ooh. but not in another place. Oh That's A/B testing. McRiblets. Just, yes. Let's and, talk about that. Yeah, yes, they're fantastic. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's Applebee's. But anyway, but the, so what happens is they're test when they test algorithms. Oftentimes they test them on, on some people and see how it works. Dating sites do this a lot. They will test an, a dating algorithm, and people go, "Well, I." Want you know, I want the other thing. Well, this could be better. So algorithms, it's, 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 not, it's not wrong to use an algorithm. I have an idea. You should create for the Gigi Show a character named Al, Al Gore Rhythm. Rhythm. I think I did not. <laughs> oh my gosh. He did invent the internet. That's all right. Yes. Carver <laughs> takes the sisterhood out of sorority, and Greg explains the Ivy League's co-ed controversy next. Making my world better than it's ever. Yeah, they cut that song out pretty, pretty early. All right, a Harvard sorority just announced they're going gender neutral. Kappa Alpha Theta, if that's their real name, will actually be changing its name, delinking itself from its national chapter, all because Harvard penalizes its members by withholding student leadership positions as well as other perks, while still charging them, of course, 60 grand a year. I know, it's hard to care about a Harvard sorority. Talk about a rough life. But it's a slow news day. And clubs, and clubs by nature are clubby. 
People join based on shared traits, hobbies and so on. If you like stamps, you join a stamp club. If you like motorcycles, you join the Hells Angels. In high school, I couldn't join the boys chorus because I couldn't sing. And I couldn't join the girls chorus because I went to an all boys school. I could only sing in the shower, often by myself. It was pure hell, but I managed. But the irony of forcing inclusivity on clubs is that inevitably clubs go away. It's not worth the trouble. Society is now in a gender panic where it's scandalous to say that boys and girls are different and that they like different things. I've yet to run into a single male who likes Maroon 5. <laughs> she will be loved. She will be I think you see my point there. And so, circ social circles will likely fold to pressure from self-serious college administrators. Maybe that's why everyone prefers to live on social media, for maybe it more closely resembles real life with friends, enemies, insults, jokes, insights, and genius. And it's 60 grand a year cheaper. Is it true, Dana? I think that that's true. You make a very good point. Thank you. Thank but, you very you know, much. I wish I knew which one it was. <laughs> well, the, the people them. like to be in a club, right? Because yeah. if you're on social media, remember it was just last week that that actor, Dual Pass, whatever, yeah. got in trouble because, with all of his friends and yeah. his club because he said, maybe you, if you want to follow somebody that might not totally agree with you, try Ben Shapiro. And then, right. okay, then his club wanted to club oust him. him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and also a, a huge... Uh, concern right now for people is the destruction of civil society. Right. And part of that is that people don't belong to clubs yeah. anymore. You need clubs. clubs. Like Rotary Club, things like that. People would get together and do things, put on the parade, have the event, help assimilate immigrants, things mm -hmm. like that. This is actually a very interesting point that you made. Yes, you know, Juan, okay, there are other, there are black fraternities. Uh, we, we, you would, uh, people would go crazy if you tried to say, okay, black fraternities have to accept white people or gay, gay fraternities have to accept straight people. I mean, a sorority is, is a sorority a sorority anymore if it is gender neutral, I guess? I think its roots are as a, yeah. as a female organization. But I mean, so much of this is kind of reactionary, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you were talking about black fraternities, black sororities. Yeah. Guess what? They were created because they weren't Yes. Black people were not allowed Good into point. the white ones, right? Good point. Uh, and with the women's thing, it's interesting. You know, the male fraternities are the ones, especially places like Harvard, Princeton, Yale, they're the ones that have all the tradition and the power mm. and the secret societies. And Skull women, and bones. Right. And women, Jeez. for the longest time, were saying, hey, how come we can't get in? You know, I mean, what was the, the Radcliffe, right? Was yeah. the girls' school in Harvard, the boys' school. Remember, all that's shifted. So we've ch seen changes. And for That's the most true. part, I think it's good, Greg. I, I think that you should be able to go. But the worry would be that, and I think you hear this from a lot of women who argue that you need women's schools, women's colleges, because that's where this women get to so be stronger. This is so stupid. It's so dumb. If someone wants to start a club and everyone calls themselves a Z, why not? You do your thing. Why can't I be a part of a sorority and we're all she's? This, I just think that this is so stupid. And I also think it just underscores and demonstrates the totalitarianism of the left in the sense that they don't like something, they shut it down. We were seeing this with free speech as well, now with free association. And I think it's a big problem. And I, I just think at the end it's uh, I just, I just think it's so stupid. I don't even have the words for it. Wait a second. They and did. I liked being in a sorority in college. But Lay did. off. They didn't shut it down. No, but, okay, but they're penalizing you to a point where it makes it very difficult to try to be a part of one. So you're making no, 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 no. It, they're coercing. If you, if you remain closed. You, have, you should be Exactly. Open. So you can no longer be a sorority or a fraternity. <laughs> Therefore, if you do, as a single gender organization, then you get punished by the administration by through things gender. like, right. yeah, through things like uh, barring people from holding right, right, right. Uh, but, but leadership Lisa, positions, things of that nature. I don't, you, can How still is that be you can still be a no, sorority. But then go join another club and everyone oh. can be whatever you want to be. Jesse, you can all be unicorns. I don't care. Hey, leave, leave unicorns <laughs> out of this. Jesse, yeah. um, we keep hearing about how important it is to have safe spaces. Couldn't you argue that a sorority is a safe space for women and fraternities? Are, I mean, it's like, it's, it's kind of strange. Men kind of wouldn't mind living with women but women do not want to live with men we're disgusting <laughs> and we're loud and obnoxious and we're gonna be making all kinds of loud noises in the middle of the night they need their space to be girls yeah. guys don't necessarily need that because we just like spread oh out my and do our thing this is why I didn't go to Harvard I mean this is you know I can't stand. what's so funny what's so funny I don't know why everyone's laughing I would also like to apologize on behalf of the five to Adam Levine I think 
he's a good singer, and I like Maroon 5. You were, you did raise your hand. For, for everyone at home, you raised his hand when uh, your Maroon 5 point. I, I don't know. I, can't, I, I, I think it's about busybodies. Yeah. This, uh, this is one of the, it's like the straws. And there's, it's like, there's a lot, there's there a was lot no of one complaining. Because there's no so much good news, they yes. have nothing left to complain yes, about. Uh, they go after sororities. Well, I think we all learned a lesson here, <laughs> that uh, Jesse has terrible taste in music. <laughs> all right. That's true. You do. Come on, Maroon 5. Do you actually listen to that? Yes. Yeah, listen, you had thrash metal in the bump in. Uh, yeah, Come Iron on. Age. Everyone in the Check audience out Iron Age. They have one album. It's very good. <laughs> Iron Age is music. Maroon 5. It was someone the, running the, over the, a trash music can. music in Iron Age was actually not very good. Oh, it was great. Oh, jeez, give them in a chance. In the Iron Age. Oh, in the Iron Age. Very oh. funny. All right. <laughs> 40 jokes. 40 jokes. Next, we reveal the secrets to an absolutely perfect day. That includes watching me. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> That song works. <laughs> all right, well, we all know that watching The Five makes your day perfect, and now there may be scientific proof to back it up. A new study says the average person has only 15 perfect days a year. The ideal day recipe includes waking up at 8.15 in the morning, sunny skies with 74-degree temperatures, enjoying about three hours outdoors, spending several hours with family and friends, and unwinding in front of the TV, and going to bed around 10.50 at night. <laughs> so what does a perfect day look like for my fellow fivers? All right, well, my perfect day is the beach, hanging out, doing activities, maybe a glass of wine, family, friends, and then some me time. Uh, yep, there's, I was Ooh. with a Stingray. I don't know if there's any other photos. <laughs> yep, that's it. All right. Jessie. So you'd like to be with Stingray. <laughs> It's not the That's beach a perfect day. It's a perfect day. <laughs> All right, whatever. Je Jesse, what is your perfect day that is acceptable for uh, national television? Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, I sit next to Dana, so every day is a perfect uh, day. Uh, <laughs> and no, I. Oh, you're so charming. I, just, I like lying around in the pool, maybe, or, you know, at the beach. That's a perfect day for me, right there on a unicorn. Hey. The good. drink, just catching some sun. Not a care in the world. <laughs> All right, Dana, so petting a dog was part of the mood boost for people. Number so one. What is your, I assume your perfect days? No, so I've got one. You know, I have to have a schedule. So I like an early morning wake up, and I like to read all the papers. And then I like to long walk on the beach or wherever I am with Peter and Jasper the dog. Jasper's, Jasper's the dog. I like a chance to read my book. I like to have a tennis lesson. Then I like to have a walk in the afternoon. Then I like to go to dinner. I like to have a game, a game night. And then I like to go to bed early. Oh. That's like four perfect, perfect days day. for me. In one. Greg, what does your perfect day look like? Well, first I throw up from hearing everybody else's <laughs> perfect day. Jeez Louise. All right. You have to be an idiot to believe in perfect days. Wisdom comes from understanding the imperfections of life and appreciating when certain things come together. That's a good day. Never a perfect day. Here's the secret to a perfect day or a good day, right? Okay. You are two different people. Right? You're two different people. I'm today, Greg, but there's tomorrow, Greg. If I really want to be mean to tomorrow, Greg, I could drink a lot tonight and then when I, and not do any work for tomorrow's show. And then tomorrow's Greg will have a hangover and be behind in work. So the key to a happy life is today, Greg, always has to be nice to tomorrow, Greg. <laughs> That's the secret to everything. Not drinking. No, that's no, why to, I like to go to bed early. No, to, no, that's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. everything is two. You are two people. You are today and you are tomorrow. And the only way you're going to have a perfect day or a good day is to work for tomorrow. I love well, it. That sounds like a good stretch because maybe if you have a perfect day, you really push it. The next day might not be you know, the exactly. best. It's a good day or a bad day at worst. Juan, what does your perfect day look like? Maybe baseball or what's... It's uh, not a bad idea, but I mean... No? Uh, you know, my perfect day, I think one of the things that strikes me is family. I mean, I noticed that on this list is kindness. And so if I, you know, like I have Sunday night dinner with my family, I always think this is great. You know, you catch up with everybody, you say hello, to everybody, everybody's there. So, you know, if heaven is like you're surrounded by people you love, I think that's, you know, hopefully that's the family or maybe your friends or I don't know. But that, to me, that's pretty, pretty good. I notice also on this list the things that entertain me, like listening to rain. I like listening to the rainfall, but I don't know that makes for a perfect day. On the whole, I'd say <laughs> it's easier to be perfectly happy if you live in San Diego, because I was looking at this <laughs> list, and it's like the beach, sunshine, outdoors. Like, Traffic. You know what? I, I, a perfect day, I wouldn't mind being in jail. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, think about a house, arre a house arrest. A house arrest, because you have no options. 
You got your meals and you just read. I could, I could do yeah, that. But no Where tennis lessons. No don't. tennis lessons. <laughs> so Je Jesse, perfect uh, day jail. <laughs> no. no. How about Maybe that? for someone else, that's their perfect day <laughs> well, in yeah. jail. <laughs> All right, never mind. All right, <laughs> we'll save that for later. All right, one more thing is coming up next, so stay tuned. So just dance, dance, dance. I see the familiar faces of the people I've known for years and every day. As I grew up with most of you, went to school with most of you, or your parents. As plant manager, it was difficult laying off people and getting the calls. After the layoff, hearing about the struggles, hearing about their personal lives, hearing about the, the community, how it was suffering. However, the plant was able to come back thanks to all the hard work from every one of you and the dedication from every one of you. And your support, Mr. President. I look around here today and I see the, the smiling faces. We owe that to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Incredible. Incredible job. Thank you. All four, thank you very much. And those stories are. Uh, inspiring for everybody in our country and you have a lot of people listening right now we want every american to know the dignity of work the pride of a paycheck and the satisfaction of a job well done that's what's happening right here in granite city made in america it's not just a slogan it's a way of life I remember when I was growing up, made in the USA or made in America, it was on everything. It was on everything. A country, Czechoslovakia, a long time ago, people used to take single dollar bills and they used to paint them and paste them onto the windshield of their car because it represented America. That's all coming back now. That's what's happening. Made in the USA, made in America. We're proud of it again. With your help, we are lifting up workers all across our land. We are lifting, we are up, lifting the up the miners who blast ore from Minnesota's Iron Range. The dock workers in Duluth who loaded onto barges a thousand feet long. The crew members who navigate down the Great Lakes, through the Michigan Solox, and on to Illinois. The rail workers who haul it right here to beautiful Granite City. And everyone that touches the barges, the trucks, the trains that carry the work of your hands to destinations all across our country, all across the world, to factories and construction sites, into our stores, our homes, our driveways. We thank you. We are a nation of builders, makers, and creators. In the furnaces of our factories, we forge American prosperity, power, and prestige. Remember that word, prestige. Our country is becoming prestigious again. I meet with leaders, they all come to me and they congratulate me on what we've done. They respect us again. America is back. Our country is back. We see the proud legacy of our steel workers all across this magnificent landscape. In our city skylines, in our bridges and pipelines, from the Empire State Building to that shining monument to America's pioneering spirit, the Gateway Arch. The soul of our nation lives in our people. 
The heart of our nation beats in our citizens. And the destiny of our nation is found in our two hands. We all share the same home. We all salute the same great American flag. And we are all made by the same almighty God. I will never stop fighting for you because I know that you are the ones that are rebuilding our nation. You are the ones reclaiming our dreams. And yes, you are the ones who are making America great again. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you, everybody. Hello, everyone. I'm Juan Williams, along with Lisa. I see the familiar faces of the people I've known for years and every day. As I grew up with most of you, went to school with most of you, or your parents. As plant manager, it was difficult laying off people and getting the calls. After the layoff, hearing about the struggles, hearing about their personal lives, hearing about the, the community, how it was suffering. However, the plant was able to come back thanks to all the hard work from every one of you and the dedication from every one of you. And your support, Mr. President. <clears throat> I look around here today and I see the, the smiling faces. We owe that to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Incredible. Incredible job. Thank you. All four, thank you very much. And those stories are uh, inspiring for everybody in our country, and you have a lot of people listening right now. We want every American to know the dignity of work, the pride of a paycheck, and the satisfaction of a job well done. That's what's happening right here in Granite City. Made in America. It's not just a slogan. It's a way of life. I remember when I was growing up, made in the USA or made in America, it was on everything. It was on everything. A country, Czechoslovakia, a long time ago, people used to take single dollar bills and they used to paint them and paste them onto the windshield of their car because it represented America. That's all coming back now. That's what's happening. Made in the USA, made in America. We're proud of it again. With your help, we are lifting up workers all across our land. We are lifting, we up, are lifting the up the miners who blast ore from Minnesota's Iron Range. The dock workers in Duluth who loaded onto barges a thousand feet long. The crew members who navigate down the Great Lakes, through the Michigan Solox, and on to Illinois. The rail workers who haul it right here to beautiful Granite City. And everyone that touches the barges, the trucks, the trains that carry the work of your hands to destinations all across our country, all across the world, to factories and construction sites, into our stores, our homes, our driveways. We thank you. We are a nation of builders, makers, and creators. In the furnaces of our factories, we forge American prosperity, power, and prestige. Remember that word, prestige. Our country is becoming prestigious again. 
I meet with leaders. They all come to me and they congratulate me on what we've done. They respect us again. America is back. Our country is back. We see the proud legacy of our steel workers all across this magnificent landscape. In our city skylines, in our bridges and pipelines, from the Empire State Building to that shining monument to America's pioneering spirit, the Gateway Arch. The soul of our nation lives in our people. The heart of our nation beats in our citizens. And the destiny of our nation is found in our two hands. We all share the same home. We all salute the same great American flag. And we are all made by the same almighty God. I will never stop fighting for you because I know that you are the ones that are rebuilding our nation. You are the ones reclaiming our dreams. And yes, you are the ones who are making America great again. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you, everybody. Hello everyone, I'm Juan Williams along with Lisa Booth, Jesse Waters, Dana Perino, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York, actually a little later. It's New York in New York City, and this is The Five. As you just saw, President Trump wrapping up a speech to steelworkers in Illinois just moments ago. He's also visited farmers in Iowa that was earlier today. We had this hat made up. Look at that. This, awesome. It's the John Deere colors, actually. But make our farmers great again, isn't that great? Right? Make our <laughs> Basically, we opened up Europe. And that's going to be a great thing for Europe. And it's been really going to be a great thing for us. And it's going to be a really great thing for our farmers. After years of shutdowns and cutbacks, today the blast furnace here in Granite City is blazing bright. Workers are back on the job. And we are once again pouring new American steel into the spine of our country. Now, some people are saying one of the biggest problems for Democrats in 2018 this year and 2020, the presidential election year, is the party's inability to develop a cohesive message to counter President Trump. In fact, an op-ed in the New York Times today foreshadows Trump winning re-election in 2020 due to the strong economy. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is rumored to be a future possible opponent of the president's, offered a much different approach than Trump. Here she is calling for higher taxes. There was a time in a very prosperous America, uh, an America that was growing a middle class, an America in which working families were doing better generation after generation after generation, where the top marginal rate was well above 50%. So, Jesse, I think the president and Republicans want to talk about the economy, about the stock market doing well. They, they've had some trouble delivering the message on the benefits of the tax cut. But we see the president getting out there, and this may be the message he wants to deliver going into the midterms. First of all, I want that green hat. That looks pretty good. And, uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It would cover up our, our, our wonderful yeah, haircut. Yeah, you did just get your haircut, Jesse. That's true. You know what? I don't what a waste that. of money if you do um, that. I think I agree. I think Trump needs to focus like a laser on the economy and law and order and judges and keep hammering Democrats as socialist freaks who kneel during the national anthem. There are great headlines coming out of the economy. We're supposed to get an enormous GDP number tomorrow maybe three, four, five percent. We've had three straight quarters of three percent GDP economic growth and the low unemployment's fantastic for everyone and the tax cut has delivered a $2,600 cut to every family in this country. But there are areas of concern. The wages dipped a little bit the last quarter. They're still up 
2.8%, where under Obama they were flat. And the trade deal is tough because, you know, you see some places like we were talking about, you know, you have steel companies closing and then you have aluminum companies opening up. And what he did with the EU was actually very smart. I think what he did is he's saying for short-term pain, we want long-term gain. So he raised some tariffs and they came back begging yesterday and they have a verbal deal and they're going to now drop the tariffs on non-industrial goods. They're going to drop the tariffs on liquefied natural gas. We still have the auto tariffs in play, which isn't good for Michigan and South Carolina. But all in all, you know, the, the, the farm subsidies, I think, are good politics, but bad economics. But it's just showing the trade partners, listen, we're going to soften the blow because you're not going to inflict any pain on us. And in order to eventually bring down all trade barriers, and that's the goal, free and open and fair trade. Okay, so Dana, Jesse makes the case, I think, from the Trump perspective, that you want your partners, I think the president said his favorite word is reciprocal. 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 Yeah. But here's the thing. In the papers today, it said, My Little Pony, Jack Daniels, Coca-Cola, GM, the farmers, and Whirlpool all say, you know what, this is hurting us, hurting our profits. It is, and I, well, and I think that's one of the reasons you saw the president, one, be conciliatory towards the EU yesterday. It's just good for our allies for us to be, work together. They didn't actually agree to anything yesterday. They just agreed to stop fighting in public and to deal with the issues. And I, it, that's great because we need to fight as allies against uh, countries like China. I think that the president is smart to get out of town. If, in the early years of the Bush administration, that first term, the economy was great. You could not get a lot of media coverage around it. Obviously, we were at war as well. The, f the great thing for the president, if he wants good headlines, is he has to go to these places and watch where the president goes. He's going to places where he can help vulnerable Republican members. He went to Iowa today in Illinois. There's two members there, Republicans, that are in very bad shape, and he wanted to go and help shore them up. He'll probably return to those places. Uh, the other thing I would say is getting that Wisconsin, Minnesota,